The following program was produced by the United States Courts. Good afternoon. Welcome to the latest program in the AO Knowledge Seminar Series. My name is Terry Savane. I'm the moderator for today's program where we'll be giving you an insider's look at three prominent national jurisdiction courts. During today's program, Judge Pogue of the U.S. Court of International Trade, Chief Judge Campbell Smith of the Court of Federal Claims, and Judge Clevenger from the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit will be giving you an insider's look at the national jurisdiction courts. Now, please join me in welcoming our panel of judges. We'll begin the program with Judge Pogue and the structure of the National Jurisdiction Courts. Judge Pogue. Thank you very much, Terry. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, the U.S. Court of International Trade is an Article III court under the Constitution. Like the district courts, it is a trial-level court with a rolling docket, which means the cases are assigned seriatim to the judges as, as they're filed. Unlike the district courts, it has nationwide jurisdiction over a specific subject matter cases arising out of the import and trade laws of the United States. The court has an authorized complement of nine active judges uh, from a variety of backgrounds, including government service, private practice, and academia, and a courthouse located in New York City. Today, the court has jurisdiction to review uh, trade cases that come mostly from six federal agencies, Customs, Homeland Security, the Treasury, Commerce, the International Trade Commission, and the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, thus, the court has jurisdiction over economic litigation uh, that helps set the rules of the road for what Judge Clevenger earlier described as the great economic engine uh, with which the United States is blessed. So, over to you, Patricia. Thank you kindly. Good afternoon. The Court of Federal Claims, its current structure was put into place in 1982. At present, the court consists of 16 judges at its full complement. Each of the judges is appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate for a 15-year term. I sh would add uh, to Judge Pogue, we're a trial court. Um, we, everything is decided by uh, judges. We have no juries. We have no criminal uh, jurisdiction that we hear. Uh, and as Judge Pogue indicated, we're a, a national court. We are established under Article I in contradistinction to uh, uh, Judge Pogue's court. The court at present has 10 active judges, six vacancies, and seven recalled senior judges uh, in dis distinction uh, to district court judges. Once a judge has served a 15-year term, Unless that judge is recalled by a senior uh, by the chief judge, the judge takes senior status and does not hear any more cases. And that is a distinction um, from uh, the district courts that are under Article Three. Of the ten active judges that we currently have on the court, one has been reappointed to serve a second 15-year term. And I will note that the process for reappointment to the court is the same as the appointment process, which requires appointment by the president and confirmation by the Senate. A distinguishing our court from uh, other courts is the way that the chief judge is uh, selected. Unlike other uh, courts that rely on a seniority system, the Court of Federal Claims is unique that the chief judge is designated uh, at the prerogative of the president. Thank you kindly. <coughs> judge Clevenger. <clears throat> the Federal Circuit <clears throat> is an Article III court. Uh, our judges have lifetime appointments, are confirmed by the Senate, is the same as with regard to Judge Poe's court. We are the newest Federal Circuit Court, having been created in 1982 by the merger of the old Customs and Court, Patent, Customs Court and Patent Appeals, which was a predecessor court to Judge Poe's court, and the old Court of Claims, the predecessor to Chief Judge Campbell Smith's court. We have 12 active judges in our complement. With the moment, we have one vacancy. We have six senior judges. <clears throat> we sit in a courthouse in the United States, here in Washington, on Lafayette Square, in the building that was previously occupied by the uh, Claims Court and the Court of Customs and Patent Appeals. Uh, we didn't need a new courthouse when they merged our two courts. 
We sit in panels of three. Uh, our panels are composed by a computer and the cases are assigned to panels by computer in a random manner so that the mix of judges and the mix of cases is done in a random way. The computer makes certain that we don't all sit together too frequently or have lopsided dockets for our cases. Our court sits every month out of the year, unlike the regional circuits, which typically take a summer recess. <clears throat> um, we have our own bar association, of which we're very proud for the Federal Circuit Bar Association, 2,500 members strong. That's where we are and what we do today. Thank you, Judge Clevenger. Next, we'll be going over the, the history of the courts and some of the reasons for the creation of these national jurisdiction courts. Judge Pope. Court of International Trade traces its origins to Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, which provides that all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. According to the annals of the Constitutional Convention, the uniformity requirement was adopted to ensure that Congress might not have the power of imposing unequal burdens, that it might not be in their power to gratify one part of the Union by oppressing another. Uh, in other words, the provision was designed to, to uh, limit or prevent regional conflicts over the imposition of tariffs, which were then, of course, the major source of funding for the federal government. And thus, it was intended to contain the tension between regions and the dysfunction that that kind of tension could produce. Um, it may still produce. Uh, the requirement also reflected the founders' broader vision uh, as George Washington stated in his farewell address, that harmony and liberal intercourse with all nations are recommended by policy, humanity, and interest. But even our commercial policy should show an equal and impartial hand in order to give to trade a stable course to define the rights of our merchants and to enable the government to support them. Some historical context for understanding the Constitution's uniformity requirement may be helpful. Uh, in fact, disputes over the imposition of duties on imported goods predated the Constitution. They were resolved in the United Kingdom and the colonies through common law assumption actions against individual collectors, challenging their imposition of duties. Uh, because of the possibility that the collectors could be ordered to return funds, uh, individual collectors began to withhold duties collected rather than promptly remitting them to the Treasury. Um, for fear that they would be ordered to send back money that they didn't have. Um, so in 19, 1839, Congress enacted legislation requiring immediate remission and asserting the Secretary of the Treasury's authority as final arbiter of importers' refund <coughs> claims. But two things slowed the development of a modern institutional and judicial structure for the enforcement of the Constitution's uniformity requirement. The first was corruption. Uh, springing from the partisan spoils system for making political appointments. During the pre-Civil War era, the records of the 1839 Ewing Commission, which was a special investigative commission appointed by President, at the direction of President Tyler, documented widespread bribes, uh, fraud, and conversion of public funds in the Customs House in New York City. Uh, the second was regional and partisan uh, divisions, which were exemplified by the nullification crisis of, 19, of 1832 and 33, when South Carolina passed an ordinance purporting to nullify um, federal tariffs. The failure to develop a modern uh, administrative system led to uh, a big backlog of customs cases. There were 4,000 such cases pending in New York in 1890, so that led to federal legislation that developed uh, first the Board of General Appraisers, which evolved over time into the current modern day court. Uh, that court was given jurisdiction over anti-dumping and countervailing duty cases in the 1920s, which are cases involving claims of unfair pricing practices and subsidized pricing by foreign manufacturers. And that again involved uh, to the 1980 Court of International Trade with present day jurisdiction. Thank you kindly. The Court of Federal Claims traces its origins back to 1855 when Congress established the United States Court of Claims to provide for the determination of private claims against the United States. 
The legislation that established the court was signed into law in February 1855 by President Franklin Pierce. Throughout its nearly 160 year history, its purpose has remained the same. The federal government stands as the defendant and may be sued by citizens seeking monetary redress. For this reason, the court has been referred to as the keeper of the nation's conscience and the people's court. As originally created in the mid-1800s, the court lacked the essential judicial power to render fi final judgments. Anecdotally, the uh, court was established to support uh, the claims that were coming forward through the Civil War and became an important resource as uh, it, it, its Article I designation indicates to Congress who would get uh, petitions from uh, individuals, citizens, who claimed that their property had been taken or their cotton had been uh, used <clears throat> and without compensation during the Civil War and were seeking redress. Congress uh, re regarded the Court of Federal Claims, uh, then the Court of Claims, as a resource to investigate the claims and make a recommendation to Congress as to whether compensation was owed. And so there were a lot of private bills of relief that Congress got into the business of responding to as a, as a result of the war. Uh, President Lincoln took steps to not have uh, Congress in the position of um, dealing exclusively with these private bills of, of relief and insisted in his annual message to Congress in 1861 that it is as much the duty of government to render prompt justice against itself in favor of citizens as it is to administer the same between private individuals. As a result, in 1887, Congress passed the Tucker Act, which broadened a, a little bit the jurisdiction, which is the ability to hear certain types of cases for the court. And simply put, any claim that is brought against the government for money relief in particular is the type of claim that the court uh, hears. So the government is always the defendant. I'll get into a little bit later the particular types of cases that this might look like. A uh, hundred years after that um, pivotal statute was established, the Court of Federal Claims came into, and the name changed uh, at times, came into its current um, incarnation. In 1987, the Vaccine Act was passed and added a, another area of jurisdiction, um, the Office of Special Masters, which is staffed by eight special masters who are judicial officers that decide claims that, uh, in which a claimant indicates that an injury has occurred as a result of receiving vaccines. While the vaccines are vaccines that are prescribed for children and routinely administered, the way that the program has evolved, particularly with the administration of the influenza vaccine, most of the claims that are brought before the Office of Special Na Masters now involve adults. Uh, and that summarizes what our history and what our current situation is. I'll just add, because uh, Judge Clevenger is going to build on this, that as the Court of Federal, um, the Court of Claims changed, it was a trial court initially, and it's eventually merged in the early 1900s to have trial court judges and appeal judges that sat within the same court. Uh, and that sets the stage for what happened formally in 1982. Judge Clevenger. <clears throat> As our court was only created in 1982, <clears throat> we don't enjoy the rich history that reaches back into the 1800s of the two courts that you've just heard. So I'm sure everyone in the audience either remembers the 1970s or read about them. Remember the 1970s when the economy of the United States changed? The Japanese automobiles arrived, remember that? And the U.S. steel industry went someplace else, remember that? And no longer did your tires have Goodyear on them or that name, at least they weren't made in the United States. So as industry in the United States, hard industry I'll call it, hard goods began to suffer, those of the captains of industry began to realize that ideas were important, really important, more so than ever. And ideas receive, ideas are property and they receive their protection through patents. At the same time that that trend in the economy was happening, the students of patent law were appreciating and understanding that the patent law was being administered unevenly across the land. In some circuits, patents were invalidated regularly and held not to be infringed. 
In other, case, in other circuits, the patents were being upheld in a strong way. The desire and the pharmaceutical industry was growing into great significance. Great amounts of money are required to find a new pharmaceutical they can bring to market. The patent protects those pharmaceuticals so that companies can regain their costs of doing business, uh, research, and make it. So the spirit grew thinking that maybe what we needed was a national court a national court to review patent cases so as to have uniformity. And from that idea grew the notion of creating a, such a court. At the same time, there was worry about specialization. There's always been a fear in the American judicial system of specialists. We prefer generalists, our regional circuits, our district court judges, our judges even that are appointed to Judge Polk's court, to your court, come from diverse backgrounds. And so, because there was this worry about just a patent court, they thought, well, how can we overcome this problem of just having a patent board? And someone came up with the idea, well, why don't you merge the old customs and patent appeals court with the court of claims? Both have national, nationwide jurisdiction. We'll throw in jurisdiction over all the patent cases from the US district courts, and we'll add some additional jurisdiction, for example, reviewing cases from the Merit Systems Protection Board, which is the old Civil Service Commission, which decides issues regarding federal employees and their rights in the workplace. And so that's what gave rise to the Federal Circuit. It was essentially the push for a united, across the board, nationwide patent court, so as the law would be administered even-handedly. So the court was created. Each of the courts that you've just heard described have rich histories of precedent reaching all the way back into the 1800s. That body of precedent is the law that they, these my two colleagues apply on an everyday basis. But the federal, and all the regional circuits have big bodies of historic law that they enforce. But the federal circuit had no law. It opened for business on October 1, 1982, with no law to apply. And so, boom. 28 days later, the court sat in bank and decided the prudent thing to do was to adopt all of the precedent of the Court of Customs and Patent Appeals and all of the precedent of the Court of Claims as our law. So we had law to enforce going forward. And that's what happened, and that's how we got created. So we're going to have some discussion on the types of cases in the National Jurisdiction Court. Judge Pope? Uh, to start with, it may help to compare our court to the World Trade Organization, and many of you may be familiar with that organization and its dispute resolution process and wonder how that differs with, uh, from the process and the cases at our court. Uh, so under our international trading agreements at the WTO, a government uh, may bring a dispute with another government claiming non-compliance of those agreements before a dispute settlement panel uh, and if the complaining government is successful and the uh, other government refuses to resolve the matter, the complaining government may withdraw concessions under the international trading regime as the remedy. Um, so withdrawal of concessions is, is the common remedy. On the other hand, in our court, similarly, the government will always be a party but cases may also be brought by pi private parties, importers, uh, foreign producers, manufacturers, uh, foreign governments. Um, and the actions in our court allege um, violations of domestic law. Now, of course, the international trading agreements have been incorporated into domestic law, um, but our court can provide a concrete remedy in the way of um, of concrete uh, relief, of declaratory relief, mandatory injunctions, uh, or of the actual return of unlawful duties. Our court has all of the remedial powers in law and equity as confirmed by a law statute upon a district court in the United States. Um, an example, when Congress passed the Byrd Amendment, which provided for the distribution of anti-dumping duties directly to affected domestic producers rather than for retaining them in the federal treasury. The governments of Canada and Mexico and manufacturers and producers in Canada and Mexico came to the Court of International Trade to uh, obtain relief. And because Section 408 of the NAFTA Implementation Act promised that, the trade, that trade legislation enacted after NAFTA 
would only apply to NAFTA goods if the legislation so specified, and because the Byrd Amendment didn't so specify, then those parties could get relief in our court in the form of, of, of return of the uh, improperly imposed duties. Uh, types of litigation in our court, generally the first type, of course, the historical type, uh, customs litigation, classification legislation, originally was that black tea, bohea tea uh, at one duty rate or, or black tea at another. When I first started, one of the early cases I had, it'll date me, was with regard to the boots of inline roller skates. Were those boots footwear or were they parts of roller skates which were, were duty free? Other customs matter, the value of the goods, where they come from, how they've been tested. And the second major area are, are anti-dumping and countervailing duty, uh, duties that, that are imposed. An example of the anti-dumping duties, um, several years ago, the domestic manufacturers of wooden bedroom furniture claimed that wooden bedroom and furniture from China was being sold at unfair prices. So the Department of Commerce investigated 211 uh, Chinese exporters and producers of wooden bedroom furniture, uh, issued an anti-dumping order, and imposed an anti-dumping duty, which the parties, of course, contested in our case. Um, in our court, the, the order was upheld. The duties were modified through that legislation. More recently, countervailing duties, the hot topic of the day, uh, solar, the solar panel, panel uh, manufacturers in the United States came to our court claiming that um, the, do, the uh, sales of uh, solar panels from the People's Republic were being sub illegally subsidized by the Chinese government, and that case is, is currently being litigated. Uh, other matters that may be on our docket, uh, claims by the government for civil penalties as a result of fraud, gross negligence, or negligence in the importation of goods, or for liquidated damages, for example, suits on a bond that's given when the goods come into the United States to guarantee payment of duties, uh, various other collections, actions uh, by the government. So that's essentially uh, a broad picture of, of what's our, on our docket. The important point, I think, is that any member of our bar can come to the Court of International Trade in an action for review of the duties imposed with the confidence that that, that review will be conducted according to a established and uniform standard of review, most often the substantial evidence or in accordance with standard of, re, uh, of law review that is typical of our administrative actions in the federal courts. And in that way, the court contributes to the achievement of that constitutional mandate that was uh, the source of our original jurisdiction. Thank you. I will begin talking broadly about the types of cases that uh, the Court of Federal Claims hears and then move into a description of particular types of cases to uh, bring the descriptions alive. The government is a big contractor, and that's most of the business that we do at our court are government contracts, everything from toilet paper to military uh, uh, missiles. And as folks are bidding for those contracts, trying to obtain those contracts, if they become disappointed in not obtaining a contract that they desire, they can come to the Court of Federal Claims bringing what's called a bid protest claim, which is to basically um, challenge uh, the fact that they lost the bid. Uh, we also have government contract disputes that arise when you are contracting with the government but something goes awry and either you're not happy as the contractor or the government is not happy with your performance and a uh, difficulty will arise and in that circumstance we can hear the case. We have takings claims and uh, which are when property has been taken generally and the question is, is it physical property or is it a regulatory taking that may take your right to do something? And I'll come back and explain that uh, momentarily by, um, with an illustration. Tax refund cases where you've paid your taxes up front and you want to get the money back. Indian claims uh, that are brought generally uh, brought by tribes uh, who've been recognized by the government and bringing claims that the government has mismanaged uh, money that was being held in trust for the uh, Indian tribe. Civilian and military pay claims, either you don't like, uh, veterans don't like their disability uh, determinations or um, retirement determinations or uh, government employees who don't believe they were paid enough uh, or paid at all. 
um, uh, in, in particular instances. For example, the, um, during the government shutdown, the employees that had to work and were not paid um, on time have filed suit within the Court of Federal Claims um, seeking damages for the period of time that they did not uh, receive their pay. Uh, claims for government patent and copyright violations and the vaccine injury claims, among which the, this would be the Office of Special Masters that has exclusive uh, national jurisdiction to hear in the first instance those claims, and that was where the autism uh, cases were heard here in the United States um, uh, that were uh, uh, reached a decision. I just wanted to bring alive a, a few of the topics and some of the interesting cases because the facts are, are what um, is interesting. Uh, in the context of uh, physical takings, that generally involves the Army Corps of Engineers, for example, who has done some dam work or dredging, uh, and once they've completed their work, it's led to um, flooding on surrounding land, and it would be the landowners who um, are, are complaining about the inability to use their flooded land that would bring a takings claim in that particular instance. There are also what are known as regulatory claims, and let me um, elaborate on this. There um, was a claim brought by an ostrich farmer who desired to sell his ostrich meat to Fuddruckers. And when the regulations changed, I, it, in the event that you don't know, ostriches are regulated like chickens. And when the regulations changed for chickens that you required so much square footage uh, for your chickens, certainly ostriches who are magnitude, orders of magnitude larger, they required a lot more space. And uh, in that instance, the, um, the ostrich farmer be, was aggrieved because he could not turn a profit with the very few ostriches he could have under those, those new regulations. And so he did bring a suit and um, was unsuccessful. Uh, there, for example, a, a tax refund case um, that comes forward, there is a gentleman, um, one of the more interesting, who was the precursor, uh, founded a business that was the precursor to eBay, uh, became with his many profits, became quite an avid car collector and purchased a McLaren F1. In the event that you don't know what it is, the price tag is $1.3 million uh, for the car and he wanted to avoid paying taxes on the car, although he did and then decided that because he never really intended to drive it, but to sit it in his garage and entertain his friends, that he should get a demonstrator exception. It turns out that um, the, the tax regulations really limit that to dealers, um, automobile dealers. So the fact that you just want people to come admire it in your home, if you're not a dealer, um, you don't get the, the benefit. And so uh, he did not get his money back. Um, and I think that, that gives you just a couple of examples of the, the types of, of cases. I will add another one that was has come to mind that was kind of funny. There was a Mexican national uh, that was stopped going back to um, uh, Mexico in a car uh, that he had purchased from a US auction here in the United States. And embedded in the panels in the car was stale marijuana. And uh, the, 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 um, and, and we sort of laughed in chambers, was the offense that the marijuana was stale or was it that he actually bought a car that had this in it and was trying to get back into Mexico um, with the car? Uh, but um, he brought a claim against the United States auction, the, um, the, the folks who had sold the car and that's how the matter ended up in, in our court and uh, he yet turned out to be unsuccessful as well in his claim for, uh, you could read the case, but I think the facts themselves are kind of fun. <laughs> Judge Clevenger. Well, now, now you get an idea of the interesting cases that come to our court because all of the appeals from the courts of my colleagues here come directly to the Federal Circuit and no place else. Uh, in the car case, uh, the contract that the gentleman signed when he bought the car from auction he said you buy it as is. And as is means as is. And that was less uh, it turned out to be stale marijuana, and, and that's the reason why he lost. Um, the Federal Circuit is an appellate court, so the, what we don't do that my colleagues do is we don't find facts. District courts, trial courts, court of national trade, the court of federal claims, they find the facts, and then they take the law as has been given to them essentially through the Supreme Court and our court, and they apply the law to those facts. So. 
When the case comes on appeal to me, traditionally, the argument is the court misapplied the law. Occasionally, there'll be an argument that the court misfound the facts, but there's great deference to the, to the trial venues in terms of the facts. So what we are doing is reviewing to try to decide whether or not the law was properly applied and where we have differences between the courts is when we think the law was not properly applied. Uh, you got an idea from, from Judges Pogue and Campbell Smith about the range, the rich range of subject matter that comes to them, that all comes to us. I just want to highlight three particular areas of additional jurisdiction we have. The Merit System Protection Board, the Veterans Administration, and one aspect of our patent jurisdiction. The Merit System Protection Board, I think you may know, is the administrative institution to which all of you go if you believe you have been treated unfairly in the workplace. If you've been disciplined, you believe without cause, if you've been fired, called separated from service, if you've been denied an increase that you think you should have had your venue, you go to the to MSPB to a trial, Article I trial, and have your hearing. If you lose in front of that institution, you come to our court. So if you think of the federal government as what? As the biggest employer that's ever existed. Bigger than Rome, bigger than Greece, bigger than both of them put together. And you say, what is the MSPB? Well, it's really the labor law. It's the NLRB for the for federal government workers. And you don't go to the NLRB when you have a problem, you go to the MSPB. And so think of the MSPB as the labor lawyers for the federal government. And then think of the federal circuit as the appellate body that reviews their work nationwide. Doesn't make any difference where you work, what state, what territory you work in. There's nationwide review in our court. The Veterans Administration, until 1988, veterans, people that put themselves in harm's way, men and women in our service, had no access to an Article III tribunal to complain if their rights to benefits had been denied. Most of the benefits come in favor, or, or, or in, in the category of injuries or diseases that our veterans have incurred while in service. The law provides them with benefits to try to make up for and accommodate those injuries and diseases. In 1988, the Congress created an administrative court in the Veterans Administration and then appeal from that institution to the federal circuit. So for the first time, starting in 88, veterans have had access to a federal appellate court for a review of their claims. And as it turned out, a significant body of our cases, perhaps second, sometimes third, to our patent jurisdiction, which is the largest group of our cases, come the veterans' cases. Third, in terms of our patent law jurisdiction, I thought I would discuss with you just one aspect. Uh, as you all know, if you are ill and you go to the, the drugstore and you buy a, a pharmaceutical product, sometimes it costs a lot of money, quite a lot of money. And typically it costs a lot of money because it's covered by a patent. A lot of money went into discovering and perfecting and testing the drug. The drug company wants to recover those developmental costs and still make a profit. Until the mid-80s, the generic industry of pharmaceuticals, which are companies that didn't invent the composition but can copy it exactly, the generic industry couldn't put its product on the, in the market until the patent had expired. The patent has a 20-year term. So for 20 years, you have to pay the higher price for patents. So the Hatch-Waxman Act was enacted in Congress in the 80s to provide a way in which a generic company who wanted to get into the marketplace could create a lawsuit. They could say, we are promising to come in the market, which created what was called an act of infringement, which then allowed the courts to decide if the patent was valid. Many patents that get issued are not, they were not good patents. They should not have been issued. There's a whole test, a lot of legal rules for figuring that out. But the Hatch-Waxman Act allowed the generics to stimulate that lawsuit the minute after the patent was, was, was granted, if they wanted to, to come into the marketplace and say, that's not a good patent, get rid of it. And if, they, if the jury could prevail in the litigation, the patent was killed off 
and the public then got access to the pharmaceutical at a much reduced price. So there is a huge volume of litigation that goes on in the patent world over the Hatch-Waxman cases, and those cases come directly to our court. And they are some of the most significant ones, although you've all read in the newspapers about the war between Apple and Samsung. Uh, we have those cases virtually one every month. I didn't know there were so many possible things about an iPhone you could complain about. <laughs> but, uh, there are well over, well over 150 patents involved in every single iPhone or Samsung phone, which creates the litigation. So in addition to the rich collection and variety of interesting cases that we receive from the courts of my two colleagues, we have these other cases from the MSPB, the VA, and the patent cases. So, Judge Clevenger, when you're hearing these cases, are, are there conflicts that you as a judge face between public policy and, and the law that, that you have to deal with in, in cases like a, a drug patent, where it could help a lot of people if it was cheaper? Well, it, it, it crosses your mind. I mean, last, last week I had a case that has, has settled out, so it's not going to be heard by us, but it involved, and I can't tell you how it would have come out, it involved a pharmaceutical for the treatment of individuals who have AIDS, uh, who, who have acquired AIDS. It's a very terrible disease, as you all know. Um, the, there are three pharmaceuticals that are primarily used uh, in treatment of patients that have AIDS. Each of them are covered by patents, and the patents in each instance still have several years to run. This was a Hatch-Waxman type challenge to one of those patents. And so I sort of scratched my head and I said, you know, uh, it would probably be a great public service as a matter of community health law if these pharmaceuticals were available uh, at a much lesser price. If you stop and think about it, you stop and think about a disease like rheumatoid arthritis in infants, which is essentially fatal. Uh, and there are pharmaceuticals that deal with that that are very, very expensive. And you say, hmm, maybe if that patent was invalid, then people would be able to sell the pharmaceutical at a cheaper price, and wouldn't that be a great idea? And to be sure, if you're a human being, the idea crosses your mind, but the answer is no. In our system, we apply the law. And if the law favors the only thing, in this case I'm talking to you about the AIDS remedy, if the patent had been valid, if there was no way in which I could legally find the patent invalid, then the patent was going to have five more years on it, regardless of the price. In contradistinction, our court went to China two years ago to meet with Chinese patent law judges in a colloquium that was designed by the State Department to see if we could understand each other. And I had a question asked to me in a forum by a, by a Chinese law student about the very issue of a patent on an AIDS drug, and he said, well, wouldn't you, judge, be inclined to invalidate that patent so the pharmaceutical would be available in a much cheaper way to the patients that needed it? Wouldn't, shouldn't you do that? And I said, of course not. And the, there was just silence in the audience and boos and hisses because in China, the judges in, employ public policy that's handed down to them from the central government to tell them how to decide cases to make things happen. And I tried to explain in our judicial system, we're not, we're not, judges are not supposed to care who wins or loses. Who wins or loses depends on what the law said, what the facts of the case are and what the law said. And if, in your judgment, the wrong person wins, that's just too bad because that's the way we do it. So, and, and you, I'm certain that Judge Pogue, for example, will see a case in which a foreign government is putting its thumb on the scale to assist the exporter from the foreign government to send goods into the United States at a lower price and undercut the domestic American industry so that American jobs are lost, American profits are lost, taxation into the fisc is diminished, all because this foreign government helped out one of their suppliers. And I'm sure Judge Pug, if he's human, would go home at night and say, gee, I wish there's a way I could stop that. But he can't. If the law says the foreign government did not put its hand unlawfully on the scale, then we're forced to apply the law as we do. And the same thing happens, I'm sure, with Judge Campbell Smith in terms of a government contract. So if some contractor comes in and says, 
the federal government owes me four billion dollars. She knows it comes out of the fisc. The taxpayers all pay for that. Maybe she wanted to think, well, gee, wouldn't it be a good idea if that person lost? But you're not at, we're not at liberty to do that. Now, that's, I think, the answer to your question, is that in our system, the Congress sets the policy. The Congress provides the statutes. The Congress then gives to regulatory agencies that, that enforce the statutes the authority to refine that law. And it's our duty simply to apply the law, regardless of who's going to win or lose. Now we're going to move on to the unique aspects of the national jurisdiction courts. And, and one of those is uh, the need for uniformity. And Judge Clevenger, could you start us off on that? Well, I'm not hogging the, the, the Our court was created, as I mentioned earlier, to have uniformity in the patent law. And the, we appreciated also that our duty is to make certain we have uniformity in in our rulings over the Court of International Trade and uniformity over the Court, of the, the Court of Federal Claims and the other agencies. And so in the very beginning of our court, then Chief Judge Markey instituted a practice which is unique in the Federal Circuit. I think it's unique throughout all of the appellate courts, federal appellate courts, and it's called our 10-day review. So if I'm sitting on a panel with three other judges and I get the, assigned the task of writing the opinion and I draft the opinion and I send it to the other judges and they make a few changes and then they sign the opinion, so it's all set to go. Does it get published? No. It goes on circulation in our entire court to all the judges, the law clerks, the central legal staff for 10 days. It's being reviewed. It's being reviewed to determine whether the court missed something? Did we miss a precedent? Did we misapply a precedent? Was somebody maybe putting the thumb on the wrong scale a little bit here, pushing us in that direction? So in our court, that 10-day review helps us to catch mistakes we might otherwise make, minimize the number of cases we might have to go in bank to overrule a case. So that procedure goes on in our court, and I think in my colleagues' courts, they have also their eye on this notion that is embedded in us in trying to have uniformity in our decisions so that the public can rely carefully on the precedent. That's what we do. Before, before I talk about that, just one question. I, I noticed when I sat on the uh, 11th Circuit that they had a process that would allow an individual judge to hold the mandate from a panel decision for a period of time. Is that possible in the, in the federal circuit? Well, that, that would be comparable to what we've decided to do to ourselves for the 10-day period. We do have a procedure whereby after the case has been circulating for 10 days, if there's a judge who is still seriously upset enough about the whole thing, they can do what we call pink slipping. They can ask that the case be held. And they then have two days in which to produce a memorandum and they're, in essence, trying to call for an in-bank poll if they do it. It's, yeah. but it's maybe similar to that. Yeah, that sounds like a similar process. Of course, at a trial level, uh, we as judges are not bound by the decisions of our co colleagues and are, are free to disagree. But on the other hand, because of our origins with the constitutional uniformity requirement, uh, we have a similar process of circulating uh, decisions so that um, we can, to extent we it's possible um, by the process of uh, persuasion uh, move move closer to the uh, to the uniformity goal. Although of course we ultimately depend upon the federal circuit to to, to reach that that uniformity um, for us if we if we're not able not able to do it. I think at the Court of Federal Claims, um, I'll speak about the two components, which are actually different. The Office of Special Masters, because it is the only uh, tribunal in the, the country that can hear uh, these types of cases. Otherwise, you're limited to $1,000 relief if you don't bring your claim first uh, to the, court of, um, the Office of Special Masters. There is an internal circulation of opinions, not to achieve the same result, but one so that everyone else has an idea of what's happening um, for individual decisions and to pay attention to things like tone 
in um, uh, decisions which are, are dealing with, everyone is injured by definition that comes uh, to the Office of Special Masters. So making sure that the, the tone is respectful, at least uh, having an opportunity to insert internally circulate matters. Um, I can speak to both the um, Office of Special Masters and the Court of Federal Claims with case assignment, um, which might be a way of getting uniformity, if you will, within particular types of cases or cases that are related. There are rules that allow if it's more efficient to have one judge hear the same types of cases so that there is some consistency and some uh, application of a cons consistent procedure for a particular type of case, but there um, is a lot of thought that goes into when cases should be heard by the same person, because when you come to a body that is the only body that can hear these types of cases, we provoke our own circuit split by letting the trial judges do what they do, hear the evidence, and all of this makes a difference. You can find cases that on its face may look similarly, but the facts and the expert testimony that come forward have some minor distinctions that could justify a, a difference in result. Or you can have something that outright looks the same and two different people, reasonable minds, can uh, disagree, come to different conclusions. And then in that circumstance, it goes to the, the Federal Circuit to help, uh, help learn which of those views is the view we would be going forward with. I think another factor that is, that is unique amongst the three of these courts that we're talking about, three national courts, is that all the judges of each of the courts sits under the same roof. The only other two courts I can think of in the land that are like that are the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. The advantage of all being under one roof is, is something that you don't tend to think much about, but it's just the presence and so in Judge Campbell Smith's court, if there's a judge down there that's deciding a case and is thinking about deciding the case maybe a little differently than some other judge had decided a couple of years ago, that's in the atmosphere. I mean, you, 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 don't, you don't get away from it. You, you, and the same is true with Judge Pogue in, in his court, and the same is true in my court. And the clerks in the court chatter. The clerks, uh, the clerks in the court uh, are all very, very bright, intelligent, hardworking people, and they are uh, aware of the distinctions. And so uh, quite often the clerk will point out to another clerk, hey, your boss is uh, doing something different than happened before. And what that does is to stimulate interest. It means that, that the judges are more likely to be actually aware of what's happening. Uh, Distinguish that to the situation in a regional circuit where you can have a judge sitting in Fargo, North Dakota in the Eighth Circuit all by him or herself with a, two or three law clerks, and they're participating in a panel. The other judge is in Little Rock, Arkansas, and the other judge is in St. Louis. And there's no interaction except on the day of the oral argument and in the straw vote conference thereafter, and then it's disappeared. And so the, I think in our courts, our ability to put our hands and arms around our precedent and understand what any individual case is doing with or to that precedent is greater because of our proximity. And I think one aspect of that is the degree to which uh, you see partisan differences uh, show up in some of the regional circuits that you don't see so much in the national courts. And it's very much, I think, because of that, that group discipline, both doctrinally because of our loyalty to the standard of review, but also, as you say, interpersonally, because we're, we're there with each other. And uh, we are freer to talk to each other and spend time. Well, and another issues. aspect is that, uh, and that we rarely deal with constitutional law issues. Uh, we, we will have them once in a while come up in our court. For example, uh, years ago, I, we had a case in the Veterans Administration that involved the superintendents of the cemeteries in which our fallen uh, heroes lie in rest. And there's a cemetery down in, uh, New, in Virginia, down, uh, and, and in that cemetery are buried the remains of soldiers who fought on both sides of the Civil War. And the southern side of the Civil War wanted to fly the, the southern flag, the flag of the Confederacy, next to the Union Jack over the cemetery. 
and the Veterans Administration had a regulation that says you can't do that. And so the case was brought and was a First Amendment challenge. Um, so we had to deal with that particular issue. But in terms of the ability of the judges to duke it out, fight each other out, uh, to, to argue and struggle over issues, we don't have issues like abortion. We don't have issues like burning the flag. We don't have issues like the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act that sometimes cause rational people to get a little emotional, if you know what I mean. And so I've always said, for example, if I was going to get really carried away with one of my colleagues, angry at him because I thought a patent was invalid and the other one didn't, there'd be something wrong with me. <laughs> um, so I, I think that we are lucky in that, uh, that we're all under one roof. And we're lucky that we don't have any of the kinds of cases that understandably might tend to pull us apart from time to time. Thank you. An another aspect of these courts is that they are national courts, but where they do their, their business is different than the rest of the courts. So we have a slide here that shows the Court of International Trade is based in New York City, and the Court of Federal Claims and the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit share a building here in Washington, D.C. But I'd like the judges to talk about where they hold trials or other court proceedings across the country. So this is the Court of International Trade. Uh, of course, the court is authorized to hold a uh, court in any port in the country. And when necessary, even to hold, um, hold proceedings overseas. Um, you can see uh, by the location there that most of those um, uh, dots are in important courts or uh, important ports around the country. Uh, I remember, for example, in Los Angeles early on, one of the first trials I had was a was a fraud matter. Um, I went out to California because uh, the witnesses were coming from Japan, so. That's the kind of thing that, that can cause us to move around the country. Then the uh, Court of Federal Claims. You'll notice that the date is just one year. This is a representation. The Court of Federal Claims, uh, as Judge Polk indicated, is also authorized to sit and conduct proceedings nationally and, if necessary, outside of the United States if it's a, a, a claim um, that merits attention there. Generally, we find ourselves and rely very heavily on uh, district courts and bankruptcy courts uh, to, to host our proceedings when it's necessary to take evidence um, or to hear expert testimony in uh, particular places, to go see the timber that is at issue if it's a takings case, um, if it's a, um, a, a timber case, for example, or to go see the land where the flooding has actually taken place. And certainly in the vaccine context where there are both injured people who want to uh, be able to hear the proceedings, we often travel to them so that, uh, and to homes in particular if need be to uh, visit with family members, but in terms of, of conducting proceedings, it is, it is absolutely nationwide and rather frequent for um, hearings and proceedings. So it's, as trial is scheduled, the Court of Federal Claims tends to be on the road for much longer, a week upwards to three weeks per chance. In particular places, the um, Office of Special Masters tends to be one to two day hearings. The autism proceedings um, were unique in which that, that was 10 weeks of trial that um, uh, were, were conducted and um, there were host courtrooms around the country, which we very much appreciate uh, who supported um, the, the court at, for those proceedings. And the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Last but not least. Well, there's a little difference here because my two colleagues have explained that their courts will sit around the country uh, depending on where the case is. So if the, if, if the facts involve Iowa or someplace, then Judge Campbell Smith's judges will be out there. We, we are authorized by statute to sit in any jurisdiction where there's a federal court. It came with the original legislation in 82, giving us nationwide jurisdiction. But we tend to sit um, where the patent cases are, where the lawyer, and where the patent lawyers are. Um, the, when we go out to sit, 
will sit in a jurisdiction where there are a lot of patent cases or, or you know, the judges that hear patent cases and where there's a significant patent bar. Because each time we do it, we, we meld our sittings with uh, continuing legal education events for the local law bar associations. And we typically also sit at least one day in a law school in the venue. And the idea there is to allow law students and professors and all not to see, learn about the federal circuit and see what we're doing. So the places we have sat have been where you see a concentration of the, the I don't quite know why the Arkansas one happened, but typically in California, New York, Chicago, and those areas, Pittsburgh is where there are large numbers of, of patent cases. I'd like to thank the panel for a great program today. And that, that concludes our program. So thank you all. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you.